Uprooted Theatrical Studios presents The Orisaya by Ellen McLaughlin, Part 1. Hi, my name is Madison Bailey, and I am reading your stage directions. Hi, I'm Chisara Asimoga, and I'm playing Clytemnestra. Hi, I'm Sammy Gaynor, and I will be playing Iphigenia. I'm Sean Martin, I'll be playing Agamemnon. I'm Emily Snap, and I'm reading Cassandra. I'm John Lee, I'm reading Chorus A. Hi, I'm Matthew Shortell, and I'm reading Chorus B. Hi, I'm Tony Schifani, and I'm reading Chorus C. Hi, I'm Sierra Young, and I'll be reading Chorus D. Hello, I'm Shelley Kiefner, and I will be reading Chorus F. Hi, I'm Amanda Lee Bell, and I'll be reading Chorus G. Hey, I'm Jake Wallace, and I'll be reading Chorus H. Hey, I'm Samyukta Vishwanathan, and I'll be reading Chorus I. Place, the House of Atreus. Act One, the ancient house, night and stars above, sound of crickets, night creatures. A watchman is on the roof alone, looking up, a cry from within, a nightmare cry, female. Happens every night, her, bad dreams. Years I've been up here listening to her, waiting like a dog propped up into the sky, watching just like she told me to for the beacon. The light in the dark that says that Troy has fallen. She thinks she set up some kind of system. The flare off the first mountain above Troy, signaling the guy on the next mountain down the line to light his stack of greased wood. And then that mountain signals the next and the next and the next crossing languages, entire peoples and countries as it runs. And it's supposed to happen all in one night. She says news can do that, pass from a battlefield at the end of the world all the way to this palace here, fast as thought. So she put me up here every night, now for years. I watch the majesty of the sky drift over me and wait for this new man-made star to bloom on the horizon there, like that could happen. Seems crazy to me, as if she could make a star. They're even older than the gods, the real stars. They've all got stories, and I tell them to myself all night to keep from closing my eyes. The skies are full of blood and jealousy, long tricky narratives, constellations elbowing each other up there, fizzing away and telling themselves. All that glory just for sleepless, lonely me up on the roof of this terrible house where nothing good happens. I ride it like an animal as it twitches through its dreams. Clytemnestra enters in her dressing gown, which is elegant. She speaks, apparently, to us. I had the strangest dream. I was cleaning the house, which God knows could use it. It's always been too much house for me. It's packed like a, a what? A reliquary, a museum, a brain? So old and honeycombed, you can't find your way through it sometimes. Crammed with all these artifacts and relics and so much history, don't get me started. The rooms, too many rooms. You can get lost in it. You start in one century and you find yourself in another and then you've suddenly someplace else entirely. A room drifted with dust, but also a sense that someone was just here. Even though that's impossible, ages must have passed since anyone but it's the strangest thing, like the carbon fizz of a match just blown out. Just there. Just there. Why does everything seem as if it's just happened in this house? Anyway, I was cleaning the house, which felt good at first. I was really getting the job done, swiping away the cobwebs in the soot of centuries. My house, walls, ceilings, hallways, gleaming with this liquid I was swabbing everything with. Gleaming pink because it was blood. That's what I, I looked in the bucket, the b bucket of miraculous cleaning fluid. It was a bucket of blood. Whose? I don't know. Mine? His? But here's the thing. It worked. The house? It was clean. So it was a good drink, wasn't it? I think you need to leave the cleaning to us. Do I? We know where everything is. 
I know a thing or two. Of course you do, darling. You haven't seen everything. Enough, I think you'll find. You mean the walls have ears? A mother knows. Your mother. My children are dispersed. Mine are here. Yes, dear, the ones you have left. What did you say? The ones you kept a hold of? My children are all here. We are all present, yes. Every single one. Of course. It's just that they aren't all exactly... Exactly... Alive. Iphigenia is heard off stage. Mama! I... You're thinking of ten years ago. She is thinking of ten years ago. Mama! But I, she's... I can't sleep! She's going back. Iphigenia? She can't help it. Go ahead. Coming! I'm coming! It's ten years earlier. The chorus backs away to let Clytemnestra shift back into memory. Stay, Mama! I'll come to you! Iphigenia enters from the house. She has a stuffed animal, wears a nightgown. It was about a war. Bad dream? They embrace, and Clytemnestra leads Iphigenia to sit somewhere. There were two eagles. Oh, that one. They, they swoop down on this fat bunny rabbit, and she's fat because she has babies inside her, and they swoop down. What was that about the war? Because Daddy's in it. Daddy? He's there with Uncle Menelaus. Watching the eagles? He's got blood on him. From the mother bunny? She was going to have babies, but they ate them. Instead, they eat them in the sky. Goodness. Daddy says that's what has to happen. The eagles have to eat the rabbits. So they can win the war. The eagles. That's what daddy says. I see. I think he's wrong. Do you tell him though? I can't. Why not? I can't talk. Yes, you can. You're talking to me right now. In the dream, I can't talk. Why not? Because I, I can't speak. He makes sure of that. Daddy does. Maybe I was really a bunny all along. Maybe he's right. Daddy. He said. In the dream? That's why I can't sleep. I mean speak. I mean. <laughs> Agamemnon comes in. Bad dream? The same dream. The eagles, the pregnant hare. Did you tell her something that would make her come up Why with Why would I tell her something like that? It, it just sounds so much like the kinds of things that are making the rounds. Why the wind won't pick up. Why the fleet can't sail. All that mumbo jumbo. It's not. There is a mystery here. Something larger than. It's a matter of finding a way to talk about these things. Ordinary language is not going to work. It's not enough. So yes. Dreams are significant. If we are to try to understand what is most important, we have to use metaphor. That's how they speak to us. The gods? Yes. When they reveal to us, they reveal in symbols. She settles the sleeping Iphigenia and steps away from her. So you really think that the gods take some sort of personal interest? It's not personal. It's more that they invest themselves individually in the matters of human beings as if I don't know how it works, but I know what's in the balance. Don't you see what a disaster this is? I am the general of an army I can't command because we can't get to the battlefield. We can't sail. Weeks now and every day that goes by Why is this your fault? Because someone has to take the blame. Why? Isn't it just what has happened? There is no win. Why does it have to make sense? Something is wrong. Something big is wrong. And if that's my fault, if there's something I've done... Why should it have 
anything to do with you. If there is any action I can take to make this better, to put my army in the right alignment with the universe, then I will do that. Why wouldn't I? I just, I don't understand why you're suddenly lost in all this cryptic superstitious nonsense. When did you become so religious? You have no idea what my spiritual life entails. <laughs> what spiritual life? You're a military commander. You order troops around. You organize death. Exactly. Which makes me all the more aware of how much is at stake in everything I do. I can't afford not to get this right. He stands looking at Iphigenia. I don't like that dream. She has it every night now. I don't like it. Isn't it just a matter of how you interpret it? The story you tell about it? The story I tell? Yes, whatever you come up with to calm her down so she isn't so scared. There's more to it than that. She might be capable of sensing something we can't. A clear vessel of the truth. So you think our daughter is a prophet? It's not about her, it's about the dream. It's something that must be understood. Well then why can't it be a good dream? Maybe the heir, maybe the babies, maybe that's just Troy sacked. The generations of the enemy snuffed out. No, it's, it's bloody in the wrong way. If that's me, if that's my brother, then what have we become? She goes to him. He is still standing over the sleeping Iphigenia. That's not you. You're not like that. She embraces him. He looks up. I see the way you look at her. Anything. I would do I know anything. you do anything for her. You are capable of anything. I'll be back. Agamemnon exits, leaving Clytemnestra alone with the sleeping Iphigenia, who turns suddenly in the grip of a nightmare. Daddy! Mama's here. She can't help me. Sweetie. Only Daddy will, and he won't. She opens her eyes. You're awake now, see? Everything's fine. Iphigenia is indeed awake, but still terrified. See? You're home, safe and sound, all is well. Iphigenia just shakes her head, mute with panic. Sweetie, what are you looking at? It's just the house, everything you know. Nothing different, the way it's always been. She takes Iphigenia by the hand and begins to lead her into the house. But we can see that Iphigenia is still open-eyed in terror. She balks at entering the house. Clytemnestra croons a bit as if it's a kind of lullaby. And always, and always, and always will be. Clytemnestra gently leads her into the house. And always, and always, and always will be. They have exited. Almost impossible, 10 years later, to remember that there was ever a time before the war, ever a time when it didn't seem inevitable. And it was still a matter of little girls waking, frightened by nightmares. Parents arguing over portents and prophecies. When no one had died for anything yet. And for a moment, it seemed like no one ever would. Helen had been abducted, yes. Her husband and brother had been called up an army to get her back. But still. But still. But still. But still. But still, nothing had happened yet. There they all were, standing outside the door of history. The coastline filled with the might of Greece. Jostling, teeming, bristling with spears. Splayed for miles and miles down the shore. All in readiness for the long sail across the ocean to their waiting fates. Then. But then. But then. But then the breath of the world dies and nothing is possible. Rumors flare in the tinderbox of the camps. Someone, somewhere, has somehow put everyone on the wrong side of the divine. Who is the sinner? 
Who is the sinner and what is the sin? What is the sin? Nothing is revealed, so everyone is guilty. And then the starving begins. And the stealing. And the fights. And no one is safe from the knives and rancor. The army without an enemy can only turn on itself like a famished wolf who begins to chew off his own paws. And at the center, the general, the little god of the great army. Pity him. No longer the single inhabitant of a single fate. He paces the cage of his responsibility. The gathered strength of the known world amassed in its roaring might. All for him. All for him to lead to glory. All for him to botch. Every day he stalks the shoreline of the sea he cannot get his ships out on. Every day under the shadeless eye of the sun on that windless beach, he sees all that he is in charge of tip further toward ruin. Until at last the cry goes up. The seer has seen, the message received, the gods have been offended and must be appeased. It will never let the wind blow. Nothing can happen ever again. Unless a sacrifice is made. Agamemnon bursts onto the stage, panting, distraught. He leans over, catching his breath, as if he has run a long way. A sacrifice. Just one. One. A child. One child. One particular child. One child. And only that one particular child. And the sacrifice must be made by one person. And only one person. He must do it himself, and he must do it tonight. Daddy? Agamemnon looks up, frightened. Iphigenia comes in, once again in her nightgown. She stands across the stage. They look at each other. I know. I saw it. So what? My death. Agamemnon begins to cry. Iphigenia goes to him, climbs up onto him. He holds her, but turns his face away. She takes his face and turns it to hers. He looks at her. Daddy. He turns away. Daddy. She takes his face again and turns it to her. Nothing teaches us. Nothing tells us the truth, except pain. I love. Memnon covers her mouth with his hand. They stare at each other. We learn nothing except through suffering. She slides down him, his hand still clamped over her mouth. She, he hugs him to her. This is how the gods convey their love. In a sudden moment of decision, Agamemnon scoops Iphigenia up in his arms and runs off, carrying her. A moment of stillness and then shutters open and two long silk red streamers fall from the highest windows of the house. Off stage, Clytemnestra screams. Clytemnestra comes out of the house to see Agamemnon enter, covered in blood, carrying a knife. They stare at each other across the stage, shaking. Suddenly, the wind buffets the stage and the streamers fill like sails. Agamemnon exits. The streamers blow out the windows and drop to the ground, where chorus members gather them up quickly and carry them off. We are back at the beginning of the play. The watchman on the roof, Clytemnestra in the yard, just having recalled her dream. The watchman sees the beacon. Victory, victory. It's over. It's over. The end of all of our waiting. All will be well. All will finally be well. Dancing, he exits the rooftops. It's over. At last. Ten years. Waiting. It's over. It's over. But he lived through it. And he will return, victorious. I always knew he would. I can see him now. This night of nights. Standing in the rubble that was Troy lit by fire bathed in blood and smoke. That city, once the glory of the world, is now a hunting ground where all night long the Greeks pick off their prey. Through empty marketplaces and abandoned schoolyards, 
House to house they pursued them, slaughtering Trojans in their kitchens and on their beds. Tonight, the Greeks, 10 years in exile, 10 years camped in sand and rain, lice and flies sleep, their bloody bodies wrapped in fine linens and silk in the houses, in the beds of dead men, free of fear at last. Free of fear, they sleep. Gorged on their enemies' raided larders. They sleep. Deaf to the wailing of women over bodies. They sleep. Surely nothing can harm them now. Surely nothing can harm them now. Our dear ones will return at last. The men who left us will not be coming home. It has warped and buckled them, that war. They know what they did, what they sacrificed from the start. No darkness can hide them from themselves. Justice is patient. And time means nothing to the truth. The Greeks may leave Troy behind them, but they pull sorrow in the wake of their ships along with all their loot. Ten years of war, and all for what? For the sake of a woman with too many husbands? Helen? Helen. 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 For whom two nations sank to their knees in blood. You cannot blame my sister for this war. As if her little affair with a foreign prince, some sordid grappling behind a palace door, could have brought down such destruction. It was the brother generals, her husband and mine, who rounded up the might of Greece and drove it through ten years of shouting blackness to punish one adultering boy. She knew what she was. She knew nothing she did could ever be unremarkable. Hell on ships. Hell on men. Hell on cities the bride of fury for whom thousands on thousands died. Dreadful power, too much beauty. And that's not power. She did nothing, Helen. <laughs> she might as well have been a statue bumbled from one court to another, never made a decision, never had to reckon the consequences of a single act. Let her run a country for 10 years while her husband is off at war. Then she'd know something about power and what it takes. But I don't have time for this. I must prepare to greet my returning hero. He exits. Chorus A enters around the side of the house to find the rest of the chorus in silence. Why is no one rejoicing? The war is finished. Hard to believe. But it's true, the war. The war is finished. Hard to believe the war is finally finished with us. And we are finished. And we are finished with war. And we are finished with war. War has finally taken all it can take. Enough. Too much. We gave what was asked and we gave it willingly, didn't we? It was not asked of us. It was demanded. And by our king. Our king. Our king. Our king. A man of fears and rages. A man of fears and rages. A man of fears and rages. We thought he was a man who could do anything. We thought he was a man who could do anything. Anything. And then we knew. And then we knew. We knew. He was. He was indeed a man who could do anything. He could and would do anything. He was a man who would do anything. Any terrible thing. But what choice did we have? What choice did we have? He was our king. He was our king. We gave him what he wanted. We gave him what he wanted. He was our king. I gave him my children, and he marched them into the maw of death. We sent them out. We sent them out, our hopes circling around their heads like butterflies. Only to have him deliver them home to us, our dear ones, as tin urns filled with dust. Ash and bone. Ash and bone, the coinage of war. No, we who mourn our dead can never speak the name of the man who took them from us without horror and the scent. And at the scent of so much slaughter and swagger. 
Foreboding wakes. Foreboding wakes. Foreboding wakes. Foreboding wakes. Memnon enters on some conveyance that glorifies his arrival and gives him some distance in a height from which he can address his people. Great king. Great king. Great king. Welcome home. We have not prepared a way to address you. A moment of awkward silence. The chorus looks at each other. You are, after all, the man who took our boys from us to fling them against the walls of a city at the end of the earth, and all to bring back one errant wife. We couldn't help but think that you were dangerous, a madman. And when you made the sacrifice, we won't name it, you, your bargain with the wind, we thought, well, we can't say. But it seems it has worked. And here you are. Well done. Uneasy pause as Agamemnon realizes that's all he's going to hear from them. First, I must thank the gods who have guided me home. It was a great victory, total, though it must have been their will. It must have been right. Troy stole from us, and now Troy has been punished, punished to the ground. The perfumes of its orchards turn to stinking smoke, all her quaint buildings and splendid palaces just winking embers now. That was the price. As for her people, rest assured, there was no mercy. The lion of Argos leapt from the belly of the wooden horse onto the sleeping city, then left his bloody paw prints down every street and lapped the blood of kings. He gorged himself. Gods be praised. Look what they can do when they are angry enough. It is beyond anything exhilarating stuff. Chorus can't quite muster the necessary enthusiasm. I appreciate your honesty. I can always see through flatterers. You can't trust anyone. I left that city all alone, betrayed by all of them, the bastards. That's all over now. I'm home. Home by the grace of the gods. Clytemnestra appears in the doorway, formally dressed, impressive. Happy, happy day, my conqueror has returned. Oh, what a woman goes through when her husband is off at war, shattered by rumors, shivering with dread, his face always burning before her. Every one of her dreams, night after night, is of her husband's death. His blood splatters her. His screams wake her. She thinks she hears him call her name across the oceans. And years go by. I must confess it now. I tried, I did, to kill myself. To end the jolting misery of it all. Cut down twice, no, three times. But you see, I couldn't believe I would ever live to see this day. This fine day. When you have come back to me, my husband. Oh, you've noticed a child is missing. You're right. A child should be here to welcome you, at least one of your two remaining children. There is Electra, of course, but I'm sure the one you want is the one you left in my belly when you sailed off all those years ago. A son, Orestes. I promise you will meet him soon. I just wanted you all to myself for these first few hours. These tender hours. Your son will see you later. Everyone will after this. Come, my king, you have reached your journey's end. But first, indulge me. It's a ceremony I devised myself. She gestures and the chorus unfurls the pooled fabric underneath the windows at the base of the building to stretch it out before the threshold, making a path of red for him to walk on. Let not the foot that trampled Troy touch earth again. No, he shall only walk on finery from now on. May the man who fell the nation stride and glory through the door of the home he never hoped to see again. Daughter of Leda, I cannot help but feel sheepish. 
a bit overpraised. I am not some woman who lives on flattery or some peacock of a potentate who needs to strut about trampling luxuries. I am a man, not a god. I feel a sort of dread at this. You don't think that you've earned the right to swagger? The great should be allowed to luxuriate in their bounty. If they inspire jealousy, and that is only their due. The price of glory, you are the envy of the world. Exult in it. It's unseemly, an offense to the gods. And haven't the gods been good to you? Crowned you with victory, rained down blessings on your house. Your wealth is as inexhaustible as the sea. She gestures to the fabric. Look at the abundance of what you own, what you can afford to destroy. This is too fine to wreck. We can always get more. It matters so much to you to win this. Give me this. It's a great, it is gracious to yield when it costs you nothing. I don't know why it's so important to you. I can't explain it. I have seen it in the eye of my desire since I watched your ship sail away 10 years ago. Your return to our house across this carpet of red. Well, just let me take off my boots. These old soldiers of mine, filthy with the dust of Troy. And when I crush the delicate splendor of my house under my unwashed feet, let no one look down and condemn me. He steps down on the cloth, a pause as he looks at his foot uneasily. It is done. A moment of suspension, all hold. Iphigenia appears. She is wearing the nightgown as before, but now bloody at the neck. A red strip of fabric, the same as that Agamemnon is standing on, gags her mouth. The knot of it on her neck, the length of it reaching the ground like the stream of blood. No one sees her. She slowly walks around Agamemnon, looking at him where he stands, still looking at his foot. Then she turns and looks across the stage at her mother. She starts back around. As she passes in front of Agamemnon, he looks up from his foot at Clytemnestra and they stare at each other. Iphigenia walks off. As she passes Cassandra, whom we may not have noticed before, Cassandra puts a hand out to her. Cassandra makes an involuntary noise. Iphigenia exits. At the sound of Cassandra, Agamemnon turns and sees her. There is one more thing. He gestures. Cassandra emerges, perhaps previously unseen by anyone other than us. This royal creature, now our slave, Cassandra, be kind to her. She was given to me by the army, the most precious of gifts, the spoils of battle, but something more than plunder. She has moved me. She is precious to you. Say no more. The life she once had, a princess, a priestess of Apollo is utterly lost. Now she belongs to me. She will be treated with the respect that would be shown to any of your things, great king. Now it seems to please you, I will walk into my father's house, trampling beauty. Rejoice in the plenty of this moment, this day of days. May all our hopes be accomplished like this. Memnon exits. She looks up. And now, Justice, perfect me. She quickly and easily pulls the red material up from the ground and follows Agamemnon into the house, trailing the material behind her. The door closes. A moment of stillness. Silence. This terror that has ruled me for so long, why won't you release me? Our fleet is restored, our long desires realized. And yet. And yet. And yet. And yet. Our king has returned, clanging victory in its spoils. And yet. And yet. And yet. And yet. Today is exultant. All our prayers answered. 
And yet. And yet. And yet. And yet. Why do these black wings rustle in my chest? Deep in the darkness of my fisted heart, a match is struck to light the, to light the bright little fire of dread. Clytemnestra comes out of the house. She addresses Cassandra. You, come in, it's time. Everything is waiting on you. You don't have any choice in this, so just look. I'm sure it must be very hard to be a slave, but this is your fate, so you better get used to it. There are worse masters. We will treat you as you deserve. You, you have moved him, have you? I bet you did. Silence. They stare at each other. What is it? Why are you looking at me like that? She's like a sparrow in a snare. Can you not understand me? Is this not your language? Do you speak some exotic barbarian bird language? She's wild caught, it's true, but I think she understands. Don't you? She must. It doesn't take much imagination, really. I mean, how stupid could she be? You're not stupid, are you, Birdie? Can you hear her? Your new mistress is speaking to you. Why are you looking at me this way? Why are you so afraid? This is your house now, your home. She'll never be home again, just captive. What will it matter to her now? One cage or another, one house or the next? You'll have to make the best of it. You must obey. She knows what she's doing, don't you? You're trying to unnerve me with this stubborn silence. Are you pouting, Birdie? Too proud to sing for your new mistress, is that it? Well, go ahead. Sing. Maybe she's beyond speech, beyond all of this. Just think of what she's... Uh, no, I don't have time for this. She's just crazy or something. Her brain's been choked by the stinking smoke of Troy and she's come undone. But I can't stand here all day waiting for her to come to her senses. You'll have to come in eventually, like it or not. Any wild horse can be broken. She can bloody her mouth, but she'll have to take the bit in time. She exits back into the house. Come on now. It's time. Come. Just get over with. Just get it over with. Submit. Maybe she doesn't know what's happening. She knows enough. Look at her. Whose fault is she? That's not the question. The question is whose problem is she? His? Hers? Ours, of course, along with everything else he's brought home with him from his war. Broken things and ruined lives. Things to fix or sweep into corners. And try to forget. Is this what we do now, take care of things like this? What else have we ever done? Poyon, poyon, o catastrophe mu. What is she saying? Who is she talking to? Apoyon poor ma ferredes. Did she just call on Apollo? Did you say Apollo? You, god of my destruction, where have you brought me? You, my ruin, you brought me across the face of the world for this? What is this house? The house of Atreus. Cassandra is seized by a prophetic vision. House of spite, house where family eat family. This is the killing floor of innocence. That ancient story. The dog has caught the scent, tracked the blood. He sees an invisible child and addresses it. Yes, child, I, I see you. And another? And, and you, dead beauty. Terrible. Yes, I can hear you. That is, that is, should know our worst history. Is that your father? What, what is he eating? What? Your uncle was your butcher and your father. You make an involuntary sound. Yours, is it? It's too shameful. Make her stop. Yours, toe, cheek, finger, bone, cut at the knuckle, tinder joints, chopped, skewered, and roasted. Yours. 
She sees the vile feast that was eaten in this house, the children killed by their own uncle and then served as food to their unwitting father, the feast that cursed this place forever. Cassandra has been crawling, gagging, and now looks up as another vision takes her. What is happening? Up the stairs, out of sight, the sound of the water, the voice, the wife welcoming her beloved, no, despised bully, no, no victim, no. This makes no sense. Paulo, please, why must I see this? What is she talking about? Home to Bavin, to Bavin. He reaches out for her and she pulls him into nothingness. Bird song, that's all, just a frightened bird twittering. Great fish flipping in her net glistening neck had caught, 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 caught. She crumples, the prophecy ebbing away. She recovers a bit. What have I been saying? Words, just words. Useless, empty. Useless, yes. No use at all, for all my sight, my great city toppled to ruin and my prophecies rolled over into the rivers over her stones. All my people, deaf to my warnings, dying the deaths that I prophesied for them. Useless, hateful gift to see it all and to have to live it twice. What good has this hammer of truth ever been to anyone? Who did this to you? Apollo. This is his love. I stared into his great blank eyes, shaking with awe. Still, I would not submit to him. You refused the god? I heaved him off. So he cursed me. Well, what could you expect? I've never been believed since then. And I speak in the dark like a nightingale to nothing and no one. We hear you, but we do not want to. Grown once more into a vision. Do you hear it? The sound of the water filling the bath, the knife like a biting fish flashing the water. It's going pink, Apollo, please. Release me from your visions. Leave me. Go, plague some other jabbering girl. Let her wear your awful prophet's hat. This can't be believed. Just another person babbling nightmares. Out of the vision. What does it matter if you believe me? Idiots. The future is plummeting down on all of us, and you can hear me now or remember me later with pity. But we will all be crushed. Blind fools. Why is she so bitter with us? We didn't do this to her. It's her nightmare. That's all. Nothing to do with us. She brought this misery on herself. Such a sad girl. Back inside the vision. Oh, Apollo, I see it. The flashing thing there in the water pink with blood. The knife does the work and then yes, it's coming. Knife sharpened in one body and then oh yes, yes. It is for me. To the god. Was that the last thing that you have to show me? Was that your final gift? That I should die not at my father's altar with the rest of my people, but be here? Just another throat cut girl for this cursed house. I'd let it be one clean stroke and then I'll be home. Such a brave girl. <sighs> people never say that to the lucky, do they? It is something to go out with grace. Oh, my dear, graceful, slaughtered father and all his graceful, slaughtered children splayed in blood and now me. So graceful and so damned. She starts towards the door, then hesitates. Oh, just one moment more. Dear son, I will miss you. I give thanks to you into the last seconds like a string of beads that are left to me here. The shine on the things of the world, breath in my chest, heat on my face, this life, this sunlit life, thank you. Oh humans, a flicker of happiness and it is over. It's you I pity now. She exits into the house. Now the sound of running water is audible. Why are people always telling us their nightmares? Is it because they want to scare us? Tug into their panic houses to keep them company? Or because they think they can't scare us? Because our minds are so unlike theirs, our imaginations just 
bland white rooms with nothing in the corners? Perhaps they think we will comfort them, pat their hands, and escort them back out into the shadow, shadowless, ordinary world. Because that's where they think we live. So we will listen to them, and the fear rises, and we tell ourselves, that's just someone else's nightmare. But then we know it's too late, because we have already imagined it. To fear something is to create it. Their visions climb into our heads and make themselves at home, elbow into our jumbled pantries to make new concoctions out of what we have on hand. Which is the past. Oh, the past. The past, which we are always tinkering with, twisting and remaking it, asking it back so that we might, what? Know what it was? Try to get it right this time. Bury it better. So we can forget it for good? The past, which is not past. We dust the mud off graves to let it blink at us again, reborn and familiar. We are people, this household, and no one ever dies. Iphigenia comes on, as before, but this time ungagged, and this time everyone sees them. I used to sing for them. The men who killed me late in the evening when they were in their cups, I would enter. My hair braided back, my square brow and a direct girl's gaze, my pure voice spooling up to the cool and smoky room, an admonishment, I suppose. So when the last moment came to me, I lay there on the block, my bare neck spiced by the morning air, and I thought, perhaps I am to die for my own excellence. Perhaps if I had just, just sung less well, looked more ordinary, I might have been spared this. She exits. There are dreams and there are memories, and sometimes, they are both. A sound, hard to distinguish from inside the house. So when the fear rises up in us, we think, is this the truth? Is this the truth? Is this the truth? Or am I just dreaming? Another sound. Is this something I know? Or something I know I don't know? Another sound. Do I remember this? Do I remember this? Do I remember this? Or is this what's about to happen? What's about to happen? What's about to happen? What's about to happen? A cry muffled from inside the house. And, and when it happens, when it actually happens. When it actually happens. Why is it, despite all the fear and foreboding, a cry still muffled but louder from inside the house? Why is it? When we finally realize this is no dream, no vision. This is no dream. This is no dream. This is no dream, no vision. This is not in my head. This is the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth. The door begins to open. Why are we never, ever? Never, ever. Why are we never, ever prepared for it? Clytemnestra is revealed, standing over the bodies of Agamemnon and Cassandra. Both of them wrapped in bloody bundles of the red streamers. I have never spoken the truth until now. I have never done anything until this moment. Just this. This is all I have ever done. He killed my daughter. The treasure I made inside my body and gave to the world. He killed her. Set this in motion. The years of nights, the nights of years, through the war he chose. The war killing my daughter allowed him to fight. I could wait. I had to, to make this justice. It felt, it felt like a mighty birth. The same yawning pain, the size of me stretched out, aching wide to bring it bloody and sprawling into the light. I had to be made wide enough to match the size of my great idea. And then the knife sliding in, meeting his center, locking into him sweetly, locking in his fate. 
is fate, is fate with every blow. He chose this long ago. He came back here for it, bringing his foreign slut by the hand all the way home to me. He knew me. He had to return to me so that this could happen. And I did. I did it. I bathed in his blood like a summer rain, flowers opening after a drought of years. It is done. I only wish I could do it again, just for the glory of it, the rightness. My arm is heavy with justice. Oh, my king, where do we live now? A place where this can happen. How will we mourn you? Who will do your rights? And don't you worry about that. I will. Who better? Family does, as family must. A grave opens up center. First, we take out our garbage, what doesn't belong. She kicks the body of Cassandra, which rolls into the grave. And then, we take care of our own. He has achieved his just end, and nothing can happen to him anymore. He's fine now. She kicks the body of Agamemnon, which rolls into the grave. Rejoice, it's finally over. The curse is lifted from this place. It is done. All is finally well. I have cleaned the house. End of Act One